This is a one of a kind prototype remote control log skidding robot designed and built by professors in Idaho. It somehow found its way to rural Northwest Illinois where it sat in a barn for 10 years. I moved it here, evicted some rodents, got the engine running, <laughs> fixed some major leaks, and tested the hydraulic system, which did not work at all. Getting it to work was not easy. So buckle up. This one's gonna require full nerd mode. Everything on this machine that moves is hydraulic, and I could not get those hydraulics to work. They kinda try to work, but the pump just won't build pressure, and I couldn't figure it out. But thanks to our wonderful comment section, I know how to fix it. All we need is a screwdriver. Ready for this? Here's the fix. We take that guy off there, that guy, maybe, off there. Now we switch this guy over to here, and this guy over to here. Oh, and then we drop a screw, and we hate our lives. Ha! There. At some point, someone must have swapped the labels on these solenoids. And I'm sure it wasn't done on purpose, but my brain just about melted trying to figure this out. And it probably still doesn't make sense. It would make a lot more sense if we could test it. But that's hard to do without the remote. And it is gone forever. I have the control box, but without the remote, this is pretty much just a paperweight. This gizmo is also 20 plus years old and it's no longer being supported. We could probably upgrade to a newer version, but that's gonna to be tough with my very limited budget. So I think the best thing to do is leverage my very limited knowledge of electronics and my even more limited free time to build my own remote control. Yeah, let's do that. Boy, that got complicated fast. I don't see any smoke. That's a good sign. Why didn't I use a bigger circuit board? It would have made things a lot easier. Perfect. This original control box was designed by highly competent Canadian engineers. It was built for industrial use. It has two microcontrollers, two transceivers, 16 pulse width modulated outputs, 16 constant current outputs, 20 digital inputs, a lockable programmable interface, and a rugged weatherproof enclosure. This is a remote that doesn't work. Even if it did work, it wouldn't work with this control box. We're gonna replace that stuff with this little beauty. It was built by some guy in a cornfield. It has buttons and joysticks and relays and diodes and whatever this is. It's powered by a $9 Arduino clone and patched together with enough tangled wire to give us all anxiety. Everything's mounted to this custom 
insulated base plate, which bears no resemblance to a dollar store bamboo cutting board. It has zero transceivers, but it does have this nice long cord that should let us operate the machine from a slightly less lethal distance. The best part is, fancy as it may be, this whole setup cost approximately 1% of the original control. You might be wondering how that's possible. Well, we're living in a golden age of electronics. Let me demonstrate. These are the control cards from an old CNC machine. Each one is a four layer PCB chock full of through hole components. They plug into this back plane. This is basically an industrial computer, circa 1988-ish. I would bet each of these cards cost between two and $5,000 back when you could still buy them. And there's 18 cards. So this could easily be a $50,000 setup, you know, back when it was new. Today, you can get one of these. It's called a Teensy. With a handful of I.O. expanders, maybe a few other chips, you could replace this entire stack of cards. This thing's also about 100 times faster and has 100 times more memory. This costs $24. Same thing with the software. All of this stuff was excruciatingly programmed in assembly language. Today, there's a program called Gerbil. It's a full three axis CNC control with a G-code interpreter, acceleration, look ahead. It's all written in C++ and it will run entirely on a $1 8-bit Arduino. It's also open source and completely free. Can I explain how this works? I guess I can try. All the hydraulic functions on this machine are controlled by electric solenoid valves. There are no manual valves with levers. I think a lot of people were confused by that. Instead of levers, the spools in the valves are shifted by solenoids. There's actually two kinds of solenoids on this machine. The tracks have proportional solenoids and we'll get to that later. The cylinders are all controlled by on-off solenoids. They're sometimes called bang-bang solenoids. They're on or they're off. And the way that I'm controlling them is by using the keyboard of the computer. The computer is connected to this microcontroller, which is connected to these relays, which is connected to the solenoid through this long cord. And when I push the right button here, this solenoid should fire. The secret, which I did not know the last time, is that two of these relays have to fire at the same time. The hydraulic system has a pump and an open center solenoid valve. The outlets of that valve are blocked off. That's very important. That's one of the secrets that makes this work. There's also a closed center solenoid valve connected to a hydraulic cylinder. I'm only showing one. There's actually four closed center valves, each connected to a different cylinder. Anytime the pump runs, it generates flow. And that flow passes through the open center back to the tank. You might think if you shift the closed center valve that the cylinder will extend, but the fluid is lazy. It takes the path of least resistance through the open center back to the tank. The secret to make the cylinder extend is to also shift the open center solenoid. Because it's blocked off, that will create pressure and extend the cylinder. We can reverse the cylinder by reversing the closed center solenoid but we also have to shift the open center solenoid. They always have to move together. And all the closed center solenoids share the same open center solenoid. It's a pretty clever setup. 
it would be a nightmare to rig up with levers. But because they're controlled by solenoids and a computer, it's pretty easy to implement. The tracks are also hydraulic, but they're a lot more complicated. They use a different pump. Actually, there's four separate pumps on this machine, and each track has its own pump. They're closed center pumps, so we no longer need the open center solenoid. There's no need for that bypass back to the tank. The hydraulic cylinder is replaced by a hydraulic motor. And the motor is basically the opposite of the pump. The pump takes rotation and turns it into flow. The motor takes flow and turns it back into rotation. The closed center solenoid is replaced by a proportional solenoid. The proportional solenoid valve is pretty similar to the closed center solenoid valve, except it's variable. By precisely controlling how much we open that valve, we can control how much fluid flows through. The more fluid that flows, the faster the motor spins. The faster the motor spins, the faster the tracks move, the faster the machine moves. Each track has its own pump, solenoid valve, and motor. They work exactly the same, but they're essentially completely separate systems. The challenge is the precisely part. Solenoids are basically electromagnets, and there's fluxes and Maxwell's equations and lots of complex stuff that we don't need to get into. The gist of it is these things run on current, and the position depends on the amount of current that we give it. You might say that the position is proportional to the current. We need to be able to vary the current to vary the position, and then once it's where we want it, we need to hold that current constant, if that makes sense. And the way I do that is with the microcontroller and this delightful rat's nest over here. I've got these big MOSFETs. They're basically transistors. And I'm using them as switches, switching them off and on very quickly, like thousands of times per second. And that basically turns them into dimmer switches. Then I measure the current across a shunt, which is this big resistor. And I feed that back to the microcontroller. And the microcontroller essentially decides where to turn that dimmer switch to keep the current where we want it. And that's called pulse width modulation. Specifically, it's closed loop pulse width modulation. There is one more little complication. Imagine this wood block is the spool inside the valve. And right now, it's partially open. This rubber band represents the spring that wants to pull it towards neutral. This rubber band represents the solenoid that wants to pull it open. Right now the forces are balanced, so the spool's not moving. But if I increase the current on the solenoid, I can move the spool. If I reduce the current, the spool should go back to its original position. But a lot of times, it doesn't quite make it. And that's because there's friction. You may remember from high school physics class that Kinetic friction is lower than static friction. That means that it takes less force to keep something moving than it does to get something moving. And that difference is the primary culprit here. This is a universal problem, and it's especially annoying when we want to make very precise movements over a small distance. It's sometimes called stiction or slip stick, the way around it is to just kind of strum this solenoid rubber band so that the spool vibrates and it will bounce back to its neutral position. We can essentially do the same thing with our solenoid by constantly varying the current so that the spool is constantly moving. This is called dither. We need to dither the spool. And if we can get it right, even though the spool is constantly moving, the average position should be very accurate. I wrote a program to do all that stuff and control the tracks. I rigged it up here with these four lights standing in for the solenoids. But it doesn't work. Like it doesn't work at all. Which probably means my program is wrong.
which is not surprising. It's hard to believe that someone who took an entire semester of Fortran programming almost 20 years ago could write a program this bad. I already deleted all the parts that didn't seem to work and what's left still doesn't work. I don't know, I could probably fix it, but I think it would be easier to just start over. Somehow, I made the program more complicated, but I think it's a lot better. I made it modular. If you want to sound cool, you call it object-oriented programming. And it's kind of a hatchet job in C++. But the advantage is, since we have four solenoids that are basically the same, if they all share the same modules, when I fix a problem with one solenoid, it should automatically fix that same problem on all the solenoids. At least that's the theory. Now it's working too good. The lights are on, but nobody's home. Let me show you 30 hours of software integration. Start with a bug, like this one, that makes it infinitely count to infinity. That's because it's still infinitely counting to infinity. Now the joystick doesn't work. Let's take it apart and restake these tiny copper rivets. It's possible there's a slight quality difference between the $700 industrial joystick and the $19 version that I bought. Oh well, it works now. No. No, it doesn't. Turns out integers aren't decimals, and the Arduino really hates floating point math. Yeah, they're not supposed to be flashing like that. Let's spend an entire day trying to fix that. Maybe we can hack into the hardware registers and change the pulse width modulation frequency. That's actually getting pretty close. This might actually work. I know I've said it about 30 times, but I think it's working now. Yes! What about reverse? Yes! Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, the yellow lights are the forward solenoids, the red lights are reverse. If I go forward, should get both yellow lights. If I go to one side, one should get dim, that's the steering. And the opposite in reverse. It actually works. It seems so simple, but it has taken literal weeks to get to this point. I've got to tune the system for the actual solenoids, but we should be ready to try this, finally. Everything's hooked up. I'm just tuning the track solenoids. I think it's pretty decent. Ideally, these lines would be right on top of each other. I've got some steady state error, which probably means I'm scaling something wrong. I'm not sure I'm going to worry about it right now. Yeah. Let's see what happens.
Man, it's fast, way fast. Scary fast. We've got a two ton diesel powered robot with tank tracks hooked to an untested homemade controller. And now we need to drive it. I would be lying if I said I wasn't nervous. Once this thing gets moving, nothing's gonna stop it, including the squishy human holding the controls. I guess we didn't come all this way to not drive it. I'm a little nervous about the, uh, the tracks. They're very fast, but also not responsive. And they seem to kind of want to keep turning after I let go of the controls. Hopefully that's just because it's jacked up in the air and it has no resistance. Well, there's only one way we're gonna find out.
The machine moved under its own power and I didn't die. So I'm calling that a complete success. However, I'm starting to understand why it was parked in a barn for 10 years. This thing is very, very sketchy. It's uncontrollable at low speed. It doesn't even seem to really have a low speed. It just lurches right to ramming speed. And about half the time, one track moves and the other one does not. And you end up in an uncontrolled turn. I'm pretty confident that my controller is telling it to do the right thing. But for whatever reason, it's not doing it. Also, we've got to make it wireless. In my head, a 10-foot cord seemed just fine. But when it's attached to a two-ton killing machine, it is not enough. So just for safety reasons alone, we've got to make it wireless. I think that's pretty easy to do. But overall, I'm pretty happy. It's very satisfying to see this thing moving under its own power. Very satisfying. Especially after all the work that I did. Next time, we'll dial back the sketchiness on the controller. And hopefully by then, we'll have some better weather. And we can go do some logging. I hope you guys are enjoying this project. I know I am. It's, it's just the right mix of mechanical, electrical, hydraulics, and computers to really trip my trigger. Plus, I'm learning a lot. If you want to see the next video sooner rather than later, consider supporting this channel on Patreon. I don't like asking people to do that, but projects like this put me in an awkward financial position. Normally when you plow a hundred plus hours into a project, there's something to deliver to a customer or something to take to market. In this case, there's nothing to sell. It's also very difficult to release videos like this on an algorithm pleasing schedule. You just, you can't do a hundred hour project every week and film it and make a video about it. So if you're a patron, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. If you would like to sign up, there will be a link in the description. Let me know what you guys think about this engineering type video format. I know it's kind of a tough sell, but if there's interest, I've got a ton of ideas. I really want to build my own computerized alignment machine, like for doing front end alignments on cars. Those machines are very expensive and there's basically no information about how they actually work. And I think it'd be pretty fun to try to figure it out and see if we could build a working machine on the cheap. Let me know if that's something that you would like to see. Thanks for watching. Hopefully I'll see you guys next time. Just be honest and tell me how much anxiety you get like, this looking is, at this. This is like a level 10. <laughs> like level 10. I would just throw it in the trash and walk away and start over. This, is, this just looks terrible. <laughs> like so much. That's kind of what I was afraid of. The thing is, I have like the engineering version of Stockholm Syndrome because I built it and I spent so much time with it that it's difficult for me to understand how normal people would, would view it. Do you remember that time when you tore apart our dishwasher? <laughs> yes. This is way worse. Way worse, huh? <laughs> Is this the one dollar Dollar Tree uh, cutting board? You mean, is that an insulated base plate? <laughs> Whatever. I feel like there's a zero percent chance that I've got these wires all hooked up correctly. Well, they're conveniently numbered. Do you remember that time when you were working on the backhoe that someone cut through the wire in? Yes. The, yeah. Were you like, were you, were you like flashing back to that time and you're like, oh, that was a lot of fun. Let me do it over again. <laughs> Except it's worse because I could have made it differently and I chose to make it like this.